The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. People have varied opinions about whether zoos are wonderful or a problem, but most everyone agrees that the treatment of their inhabitants matters. Tonight, is Ontario doing enough to ensure the well-being and safety of zoo animals? Then, as cities and towns in Ontario build at breakneck speed, should they also be trying harder to make those buildings more beautiful? Steve looks into that. It's Thursday, June 8th, and that's ahead on the agenda. Most of us will never see a lion or leopard or giraffe in their natural habitat, but many of us have seen them up close in a zoo. Sometimes that's in a big facility, such as the almost 300 hectares that's home to 5,000 animals here in the capital city, or it's in a roadside location with a smaller or specialty assortment of wildlife. Either way, ensuring that the animals are well cared for is a concern for all. With us now for more on that, from north of Miami, Florida, Dolph DeYoung, President and CEO of the Toronto Zoo. And here in our studio, Melissa Matlow, Campaign Director for World Animal Protection Canada, and Kendra Coulter, Professor in Management and Organizational Studies at Western University and author of Defending Animals, Finding Hope on the Front Lines of Animal Protection. Welcome to both of you in our studios and Dolph for joining us on the line. I should mention off the top that uh, TVO did contact many roadside zoos to take part in this conversation, but none were willing or able to appear on the program tonight. All right, with that, let's get a sense of what is happening out there when we talk about private zoos in Ontario. And Melissa, I'm gonna come to you first. Briefly, this is the definition here. What exactly is the difference between, say, a roadside zoo and what many people might think a petting zoo, a sanctuary, a safari, or even the Toronto Zoo, for example? Sure, I would call a roadside zoo a grossly substandard zoo facility that keeps wild animals in a standard of their own choosing. So you typically would see a ramshackle of different cages where animals are kept in you know, a small barren environment with little more than a food dish and a water dish and a shelter box to sleep in. Um, this could be someone's collection or hobby that they had and it just went wild. <laughs> um, and they're open to the public. These are private businesses. They're, they're they're a business first and they're open to the public and they're allowed to open because there are very little regulations in place. Now is it all of them when you describe with such descriptive language? No, there's there's definitely a spectrum of, of zoos out there with the Toronto Zoo uh, being you know one of our top zoos in Canada um, and and uh, you know there, there's there's a variety of different places but roadside zoos are typically those those hobbies that a hobby zoo that is on the side of a, a highway which is why they're called roadside zoos in a rural town um, with people who don't have expertise or any training in how to keep take, take care of these animals versus a more established professionally accredited zoo which has training and staff and a business plan and 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 our other guest Dolph will tell you more all right well Kendra I'm hoping you give us a sense here do we know how many roadside zoos are in Ontario do we have a figure on that I, I certainly know we have the most in the country What's the specific number? I think it fluctuates a little bit, hmm. uh, depending on, you know, 50, something oh, wow. like that, I would say. Yeah. It's our estimate. All right, Kendra, one of the things I had mentioned, a few animals off the top. And uh, I think when people think of roadside zoos, one of the things we think about is big cats. And I'm curious, do we know how many big cats there are in the province right now? It's extremely hard to track. Organizations <laughs> like World Animal Protection have done their best to try to, to, to establish some, some firm numbers. It's probably higher even than we, we think. Uh, you know, these, it's, it, precisely as Melissa said, this is really unregulated. It could be talking about someone uh, having some in their, in their backyard or on their property. Uh, and then, of course, we get into the, into the private zoos. So getting a firm number uh, it, a is, is tough. What will ballpark wise? Hundreds, hundreds, hundreds. Of, yeah. of, of big cats, uh, lions, tigers, uh, jaguars. Um, but again, as Kendra said, there's no public reporting of this, which is a, a serious problem for whether it's an emergency responder or a municipal bylaw enforcement officer, not knowing what they're going to come across on someone's property. Oh. All right. I, and Kendra, I want to ask you, you know, a lot of people might be surprised that there are lions, jaguars, tigers mm -hmm. in this province right now amongst us. I'm curious, what specific animals are banned in Ontario? Are there animals that are banned? 
It's interesting, in Ontario, it's actually only illegal to have two kinds of animals, pit bulls or orcas. So in contrast to a province like British Columbia, for example, which has pages of animals that have been deemed not appropriate for uh, people to keep or private businesses to keep because we're not able to offer anywhere near the level of even basic uh, welfare standards for them. Uh, on Ontario is a bit of a wild west, pardon the pun, right. uh, when it, it, it comes to, to which animals are allowed here. And, and most of it is left to municipalities. Uh, and uh, some research assistants and I actually dug into the numbers across all of Ontario's four 444 mm. municipalities, and a full half of them didn't have any regulations governing the keeping of wild animals. Uh, so that's huge areas of the province, uh, and obviously an area where we could do with some provincial leadership. All right, we'll get into that. I want to bring Dolph into the conversation. Dolph, of course, you're at the helm of a publicly funded zoo, the Toronto Zoo. Uh, there's another component to what your organization does that I think the public may be not aware of. Talk to us a little bit about the Saving Species Sanctuary. What is it exactly? Yeah, this is an important addition that came through our master planning process uh, a year ago. And, you know, as we went out to the public, we talked about our mission of connecting people, animals and conservation science to fight extinction. One of the things they're looking uh, for good accredited zoos to do is be a home for those animals that could be in harm's way. And, and you know, kicking off the show with the number of uh, lions, tigers, when we get into uh, large reptiles, venomous snakes, it is really troubling that there's so many of these animals out there, we're not sure where they are, and we have such limited capacity to care for them uh, if they are abandoned or in a scenario where that passionate person passes away or who knows what. So uh, we added this to our master plan uh, in response to public feedback and to address the gap that, that really clearly exists here of not knowing what's out there and what happens to it if they end up in harm's way. All right, Kendra, I'm going to come to you. Recently, Melissa's organization, World Animal Protection, asked Ontarians to not visit private roadside zoos. I just want to get your take. Do you agree on that strategy? Yes. If you want entertainment, you go see the film Blackberry. <laughs> if you want to learn about animals, which I think a lot of people do, you read books, you watch documentaries. Perhaps you volunteer at your local humane society or for your local wildlife rehabilitator. Right? Roadside zoos, I think people frequent them for a range of different reasons. Um, sometimes I think there is that genuine curiosity and interest in animals that comes from a very laudable place, a good place. But sometimes I think m most of us would agree that it's just the novelty or um, you know, the, the, the entertainment factor. And the reality is that we need to move away from this idea of thinking of, of, of animals as objects to be, to be put on display, uh, uh, objects that we can be making money from or, or the people who run these, these organizations can be, uh, can be making money from. All right, Melissa, let's talk Queen's Park. What is Queen's Park not doing about roadside zoos that you would like them to do? We would like to see them set up a comprehensive, proactive licensing system so that if you want to have a zoo, you need to have the professional expertise and qualifications in order to care for those animals, that you have a business plan, an emergency plan, uh, that you have the proper resources. Um, because right now, um, we have some standards uh, but it's a Band-Aid. Uh, we're seeing charges being laid and then, you know, courts are being backlogged, so we don't even know if there's a success for a conviction. We've seen that with Marine Land a few times. Uh, and there's nothing to curb this problem. We have more roadside zoos than any other jurisdiction in Canada. So it's a massive animal welfare problem and public safety problem. So we need a proactive system of licensing. And, and really, if those zoos can't uh, keep their animals to a professional standard, they should be closed down in a pragma pragmatic way. Now, is this a little bit different than, we do have some standards, there's the Ontario Standard for Care, which is, mm -hmm. you know, food, shelter, water. Are we asking to double down on that, or is this something completely different? I think the standards that exist could be strengthened. Uh, we were at the advisory table um, providing input in those standards. That was back, uh, they were adopted, I think, in 2008, 2009. Um, so it wasn't everything we asked for, but it's something. Uh, but we've, it's also about enforcement. So we um, released a report last September reviewing 11 zoos in Ontario all of those zoos um, had issues where there was potential uh, violations of existing standards. So even those minimum standards were being mm -hmm. violated. So uh, they need to be stronger, but it needs to be backed by uh, in strong enforcement or else it's you know not worth the paper it's written on. All right, Dolph, um, 
Kendra had talked, had used the language which has been used before, the Wild West. Um, and let's talk a little bit about sort of this, the sort of a, a patchwork job when we talk about how each municipality sort of has to come up with their own laws. How is that actually helping private zoos flourish? Well, I think what it's allowing them to do is is move to the spaces where uh, there's not regulations in place that let them operate uh, with their view, probably minimal bureaucracy. But what that's doing is uh, leaving animals in substandard conditions and conditions where often organizations like ours get called in to assist, where you have animals in uh, marginal habitats uh, without proper food, without proper care. And really, it, it's an absolute tragedy. And the need to get clear on the fact that there's a a minimum standard that both needs to be established and then needs to continue to evolve and improve when it comes to animals and human care to really make sure they're living lives uh, with purpose and not just because somebody thinks they're great, thinks they're interesting, thinks they're a curiosity. That's not good enough anymore. Dolph, there are a number of examples of sort of uh, roadside zoos that have sort of maybe taken advantage of, of the, the lax laws there. Do, do you have any examples that you can give us? I know there's one, if you think of just off of 62, just north of Bancroft as one example, where, you know, that has happened and the animals have actually ended up with you guys. Yes, and you know we're we're really pleased to have uh, the capacity, the quarantine facilities, the professional staff uh, to be able to help in those scenarios. Um, but really, what this is about for us is reducing um, that happening at all, uh, raising the standards so no animals are falling through the cracks. Uh, we were up outside of Maynooth um, in the past few years, and you had multiple animals in uh, containment that really was nowhere near the level it needed to be. Um, animals in, with very little enrichment, very little space in in a highly uh, competitive and potentially adversarial environment. What type and of animals? Sorry, we, Pardon me? What type of animals? Uh, lions and tigers in that case. Hmm. So I think when most people hear, uh, wait a second, that's in my backyard. You know, everybody on this call seems like a nice person. There is no world where they should be allowed to own a lion, a tiger, a primate, a venomous reptile, uh, a large uh, growing reptile. Uh, we really need to put a bow on this and make sure uh, we're removing that from the narrative because uh, it's not okay. All right, Kendra, as far as solutions go, should private zoos in Ontario be obsolete, shut down. Yes, I think we need to move in that direction while simultaneously having an action plan for the animals who are trapped in those conditions. Uh, there are examples from around the world. A number of these zoos have, have gone bankrupt in, uh, in, in, in different jurisdictions. Uh, I know of an example, for example, in, in California, where something like 28 tigers were moved to a proper animal sanctuary. Right. So we can have facilities where, where people uh, can learn about animals in, in a very authentic uh, and genuine way. Um, and so we want to be thinking about is that where these kinds of animals uh, should end up? Or perhaps they simply deserve peaceful retirement completely away from public view, given the lives that they've had, right? And so if people are wanting, you know, this is it's spring, uh, it's summer is coming, families are thinking about ways that they want to be, uh, to, to getting out and, and, and enjoying our province and, and, and entertaining their, their family members. And I think for many families that comes from a good place. I think a lot of people, as, you know, I see it with my students as well. In the past, we thought aquariums, we thought zoos were appropriate. We thought you could just pull over on the side of the road and it's okay that there are tigers in cages, that this is normal. Society is shifting. Our ethical understanding of animals is shifting. Our, our, our understanding of animals' minds, social lives and needs are really shifting. Um, and so people are asking these really crucial questions. And, and that said, the desire to want to be around animals is, is, is very powerful and authentic, and I think we want to nurture that. We want to care for animals. And so there are sanctuaries, for example, where the animal's needs are placed first, and that's, that's the key defining feature. Mm -hmm. People can still interact. The Donkey Sanctuary south of Guelph, for right. example, mm -hmm. is an opportunity where the public can visit a few days a month uh, while the donkey's needs are still held in, in high regard. The Ontario Turtle Conservation Centre is a wonderful facility where people can book educational tours. And we, of course, have an absolute majesty of wildlife, right? right? We want to think about how can we coexist with our own neighbours, whether they're you know skunks, raccoons, squirrels, while simultaneously getting out and enjoying the province and taking advantage, respect Respectfully of the wild animals we ha we have around us, with whom we share this province, we don't need to be importing or breeding wild animals who belong in the wild and really often belong in other countries. All right, so see them in their natural habitat. Absolutely. All right, so I do want to read a, a quote. You know, for their part, roadside zoos that would like to comply to an industry standard 
if there was a good one, they would like to do that. So this is actually a quote from a CTV W5 report from November 2022. It reads, what separates most roadside zoos from their better known cousins, like the Toronto Zoo, is accreditation. Adherence to industry standards set by Canada's accredited zoos and aquariums, also known as CASA. But some roadside zoo owners, like Alicia Patton at Greenview Aviaries, do want to meet accreditation standards. That zoo was one of the 11 named in World Animal Protection's recent complaint to the Ontario government. A lot of things do need to be changed. It needs to be more structured for everybody's safety, Patton said, referring to conditions at her recently purchased zoo. Melissa, I'm going to come to you. Of course, your organization was mentioned there. Uh, what should be done to, I'll, I'll get you to comment on that too, but what should be done to help roadside zookeepers keep their business? Well, um, one, uh, I think, you know, we shouldn't be jeopardizing animal welfare and public safety for an economic opportunity. And so I think there could be support for these zoos to, uh, I think they should be encouraged to, to stop breeding and house their animals to a higher standard. That might be one pragmatic way to phase the, down the problem. Um, but uh, I mean, you know, Kendra mentioned it too, like the people, why are people attracted to going to these places in the first place? I mean, I've been to a number of these zoos, sometimes spend half the day and observe people's habits. And I mean, kids are spending very little time in front of that cage. They're often just as excited, perhaps more excited about the ice cream stand and the splash pad. So there are opportunities that don't need to involve uh, animals. Um, some of these places are outside of our provincial park system where they could go and see animals in the wild. Perhaps these zoos could benefit from that opportunity and provide something else like a high ropes course or a corn maze or <laughs> you know something. Because often it's families that just want something to do. Um, if it's an education thing that they're, uh, they're, they're after, I know, you know people want to foster that sense of responsibility and concern for animals and endangered species. But I question the education you get when you see an animal in an unnatural environment where it can't even behave naturally. What is a child learning about that? I think what the, the children are learning, what adults are learning, is what do animals in suffering look like? Yeah. And, and we don't need to have the animals suffering uh, for, for that to happen, right? And often people are misunderstanding what they're seeing. Yeah. So often they're, they're, they're sort of imposing these human-held ideas yeah. on animals that they're observing, right? I think there's an opportunity for us to build a comprehensive set of organizations around the province, for us to, to, to have even businesses where animals are involved, but in a more respectful way. We could have indigenous-led tourism, for example, eco-trusts. There are opportunities for us to, 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 to show reverence for the natural world without needing to keep animals in cages or picture them simply as props for social media. All right, I'm gonna play devil's advocate, Dolph. Obviously, the Toronto Zoo. Uh, maybe, is there a case here that maybe something like the zoo doesn't exist because a lot of these animals aren't? Indigenous to to Canada. Yeah, we spend a lot of time talking about uh, where we're at right now, captivity, because um, the idea of captivity until and, and captivity by whom. Uh, they're they're really important discussions to have, and, and the root of it actually is that people aren't paying attention. You know, I, I absolutely hear you that we want people to better connect with nature, but all the data we have suggests that wildlife and wild populations. You look at the WWF uh, Living Planet report. All those things are trending the wrong way. Uh, biodiversity loss, climate change. Uh, we need to be taking not a passive, but incredibly active role if we're going to suggest that education is of value and we're actually delivering on it, actually measuring it as well. And, and we've gone through a study with our partners at the Toronto Zoo Wildlife Conservancy that actually found when it came to palm oil and electronics recycling, uh, two visits, we were seeing an increased um, tendency for people to engage in those behaviors. There were four other behaviors we were looking for that actually our approach wasn't working. Uh, so actually digging into this to make sure it's effective and you're having the impact you're looking for to get to those bigger outcomes. Because you know we're dreaming of a world where we deliver on those 30 by 30 goals. There's a space for wildlife to live. Um, but when I look at the environment out there, I get very concerned that the only place we're gonna see animals is in managed settings if we don't actually get our finger on uh, what's going on in, in, in nature. The other thing I wanted to comment, because I think it's really important and I want to build on, on, on what our other panelists have said, a key tenant for us for animal welfare and well-being is choice and control. 
And uh, we often will get complaints. People are like, oh, I didn't see this or that at the zoo. Uh, Cause those animals are offered uh, front of house, back of house options, um, areas where they prefer the climate, areas where they can get away from the public. And that's one of the things they should have in most of their habitats is the ability to escape that viewing, escape that scrutiny. And uh, one of the things that accreditation standards drive towards is those uh, key values for the animal that gets away from that that passive object that somebody sees and points and counts like it's a checklist. Uh, it has to go far further than that. And the profession needs to continue to evolve to do better because uh, for too long, it's it's been a, a copycat profession locked in the past. All right, Kendra, obviously Ontario is lagging uh, in terms of many departments when we talk about roadside attractions. Is there a jurisdiction in Canada that we should be looking at and following some sort of model? Well, BC has set an ambitious legislative agenda, um, but we might actually need to look globally. And, hmm. and I'm going to answer that in, in two ways. Yes. And in, in part, it's it, out of Belgium in particular, uh, there are what we call the positive lists that have been developed, which is the idea that animal species should not be in human hands unless we can meet a high uh, set of standards. Um, and so you begin with none and then start building which, which animals can be, uh, can be coexist with humans or can be kept by humans in ways that meet their physical, psychological uh, and social needs. Um, so there are real opportunities for us to shift our, our paradigm. And simultaneously, when we're talking about many of the wild animals who are in, uh, in zoos today, these are extraordinary animals from other countries and this model doesn't seem to be working you know precisely uh, as Dolph has said that, that we're, we're seeing conservation in many parts of the world uh, uh, decline or endangered species numbers increase it's, it's, it's very dire in the places where it's successful it's community led and it's, it's, it's conservation leaders in those countries, they're teenagers, they're young people, sometimes they're seniors, it's multi-generational where they're developing economic alternatives to support because these, these animals often coexist with people in some of the poorest countries in the world uh, and poorest communities in the world where it's seen as about science, yes, but simultaneously about job growth, about creating humane opportunities for people to, and communities to thrive. And so for us, in a wealthy province like Ontario, in a wealthy country like Canada, perhaps instead of giving our money to a private zoo, we should be supporting with donations the folks on the front lines of conservation around the world uh, and so that we can together be securing the future of wild animals where they belong in the wild all right melissa we and, talked and about can, yep. can i so, comment on this yep, yep. I just I, I, I agree wholeheartedly and one of our key uh, approaches with our capital programs now is when we're investing on uh, physical infrastructure here we're also investing uh, across the world and really looking at getting away from that uh, colonial conservation mindset we saw in the past and investing in frontline workers in these countries so whether it's an individual monitoring lemurs in Madagascar or working in a park uh, protecting orangutans in Sumatra making long-term multi-year commitments and again, our Wildlife Conservancy has been huge with that uh, to be able to make 10 year commitments so we have continuity so people can look after their families and deliver on protecting these animals for future generations. And it's a big, uh, nasty ball we're trying to unpack and untangle. But for the price of a plane ticket, in some cases, you can employ somebody for a year. So being far more um, pragmatic and, and quite frankly, aggressive in our approach to say, we're going to remove some of those safeties, make sure that money is flowing to frontline places where those species are at risk, and using uh, the zoo as a mechanism to do that, I think is a key part of the model we'd like to see adopted everywhere. All right, we're going to come back to Ontario now. Melissa, we've talked about the well-being and safety, of course, of animals. To what extent are children, the public, even zookeepers, and I'll even add bylaw officers who sometimes have to respond to this, at risk when it comes to our patchwork of regulations? It's a massive risk. Um, I mean, where do I start? There, there, have been, there have been people who have been killed uh, because of an animal in a private collection. Um, Zookeepers, you're talking about. Uh, well. Zoo owner, uh, zookeeper, would you call them? A, I don't know, a private tiger collector. Mm. Um, a, 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 and and that, that is a, an example that dates back to 2010. This was actually the, the spokesperson for the Roadside Zoo Association that was mauled by his own tiger. Mm. Uh, the municipality passed a bylaw to restrict him and he fought it and won. And so he was a victim of his own success. And this is why we need the province 
province to upload this problem. Away, correct. Yeah. He, yeah, he 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 passed away, and uh, I mean, there have been kids who have been scratched. There have been these mobile zoos are a big concern as well. They're coming into to daycares and schools and senior homes. The people who are most vulnerable to disease risks. Um, you know, there was one story of a tarantula and a, a microscopic barb uh, got into a kid's eye. When that kid was brought into the hospital, the doctors didn't know what it was. Of course they wouldn't know what it was, right? Like these are, there's so many different species that are allowed to be kept. It, it's not reasonable to expect our doctors, our emergency workers, our bylaw enforcement officers to know not only the, about the welfare needs of those animals, but also the safety risks they pose to them and, and the community. All right, Kendra, it seemed Early pandemic, it was sort of mandatory viewing uh, to watch Tiger King. Uh, obviously, a series for people who don't know about big a big cat owner in the in the U.S. That is big business in the U in the U.S. To what extent is it like here in, in Ontario? Yeah, and I, we would we can call it legalized animal cruelty. Mm -hmm. I think um, <laughs> you know everything that, that that folks saw in that show is is widely the norm. This is you know this is an absolute patchwork. Any kind of animal captivity exists across the spectrum. You have higher standards, and then you have absolutely uh, you know no regard that where the bottom line is being placed at, at, at the top priority. Uh, and 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 you know this this lousy meat, dang dangerous for people. Um, you know it, it was sort of a sensational experience, but the reality is. Is, is absolutely miserable for animals in, on, on the ground. All right, Dolph, I want to come to you. You know, many Ontarians don't live near your zoo. Um, and if we can properly regulate roadside zoos, why should the public not have the opportunity to see wild animals in their own municipality instead of traveling to Toronto? You know what, this isn't about those individuals uh, as far as the people, it's about the animals. And uh, we have to keep them front and center in this. And and it's an incredible privilege to get to be close to these animals, to get to work with them, and a huge responsibility, a sacred duty to care for them. Uh, so, uh, you know, I do apologize to them and, and we uh, do look to reach out to them with digital channels and other pieces. Um, but I don't think we're aspiring for a world where you have this patchwork quilt of animals scattered across uh, the province in substandard conditions. What we're looking for um, is a broader uh, understanding of what good looks like, uh, what progressive care looks like, and whether it's a positive list or a negative list, getting really clear on what it means to have animal species A or B uh, near you. And you know, our, our standards with the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, I think are just a key benchmark, a starting point to set that in place. And if you can't meet that standard, we need to ask the next questions of whether or not you should have that animal in your care at all. Melissa, um, as, as Dolph had mentioned, as, as we've sort of all, I've gotten from all three, is animals come first. I do need to ask, what is it about these creatures that captivate us? <laughs> oh, wow, where do you start? <laughs> I mean, they're amazing. And, and what, we've, what we've seen in our research is that it's often self-described animal lovers that are attracted to doing some of these harmful things, like the people who want to swim with a captive dolphin or ride an elephant or hold an animal for a, a photo op. They just don't understand how their desire to get up close to that animal is causing that animal that harm. So this is a big education opportunity. And it's miseducation when we allow this because, I mean, it's the exact opposite of what our conservation officers are teaching people when they approach an animal in the wild, right? It's mm -hmm. to to keep your distance, to not interfere, to not feed them. So if we really want to solve the biodiversity crisis and instill that respect for animals, we need to put a curb on our desire to get close because we're excited by them and give them respect. The best place to see a wild animal is in the wild from a respectful distance. Well, I mean, that you ask most kids about dinosaurs and they can <laughs> talk to you for an hour or more and they've never seen a dinosaur live. Right? We want to be challenging that idea. Precisely as you say, it's coming from a place of love and care. Yep. Let's, as, uh, in, our, in our own relationships, in our communities, on opportunities like this, talk about what does it really mean to care for animals. And sometimes that means precisely us, us stepping back, uh, us allowing them to, to, and to, to have live the lives that they need, need to be living in the wild. All right, we are going to leave it there. Right. Thank you so much, Kendra, Melissa, and Dolph. Really appreciate it.
Thousands of sorely needed condo units have gone up over the past decade plus in this province. And to be sure, there's a housing crisis and everyone agrees we need more as fast as possible. But for all the engineering wonders of some of these buildings, 50 stories, glass and steel, do we need to think about making it all a bit more, well, charming? With us now on how to grow cities with, shall we say, greater civic appeal, let's welcome Mary Rowe. She's president and CEO of the Canadian Urban Institute and longtime architecture critic and urban affairs columnist Christopher Hume. And we're delighted to have you two back here in our studio. Let us start with, we're going to take a look at some pictures later on of some of the stuff that's going on and get your feedback on it. But Mary, start us with this. Can you define what the charm or character of a city is. No, you really can't. <laughs> and I just want to make sure right off the top that we talk honestly about that because charm is in the, the eye of the beholder. And I always worry, and I'm sure that my esteemed colleague to my left and I are going to have an animated conversation about this because there are lots of parts of cities that locals mm -hmm would probably not use the term charm, but they would say it's theirs. Hmm. It reflects who they are. It's come up as a result of whatever needs and aspirations they had. And so it has a kind of local charm. But what I want us to do is be careful to not sound condescending and judgmental. That's charming, that isn't. It's really got to be about authenticity and resonance with the local community. Okay. And, that, and I think you can do that. Okay, Mr. Condescending and Judgmental, let's hear from you on this. <laughs> I'm, 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 I don't know if that was meant for him. I handed but it, it right over. Yeah, you kind of did. It's true. Did. Right, what can I say? What uh, do you feel you can define the charm or character of a city when you see it? Well, I know if I feel the city is charming or not. And to be honest with you, Steve, I've never thought charm is Toronto's long suit. Uh, I mean, we. We have charming areas, uh, there are charming neighborhoods. Cabbage Town is charming. Uh, the area around Roncesvalles is very charming. Young and Eglinton. This area that we're in right now, where I grew up, is very uncharming. Um, but 12, I, 12 years of LRT construction will do that to you. You know, I, I think that the Young and Eggington is now the sort of um, metaphor for the whole city. It's, it's a city of <laughs> constant construction. It's like, mm -hmm. it's like mm -hmm. 1984. Instead of constant war, it's constant construction. Uh, these pretentious, over-designed condo towers, and behind it, acres and acres of low-rise, two-story, post-war housing that somehow manages to survive despite it all. Um, but charming is not a word I would use to describe Toronto. It's livable, mm -hmm. and, and we like it, and we're all here, but charming, no. Well, he gave a couple of examples of neighborhoods in the city that he thinks are charming. Mm -hmm. Do you want to add to that? When you see charm, what do you think of in this city? Again, I think it depends on what people are looking for. You know, for me, part of what it makes a city really interesting is uniqueness. So, and sometimes I would call that, in my case, I like grit. I like neighborhoods that have mixed use, different kinds of forms, different kinds of uh, design that's been put into there, not in a quite so tidy and thoughtful a way. Sometimes I worry, Chris, with charm, that we're talking about a postcard-like, uh, you know, kind of uh, emblematic, this is a perfect city, versus you and I know, Toronto has all sorts of neighborhoods that are interesting, lots of surprises and unique to those neighborhoods. And so whether maybe charm is just too sentimental a word. I'm trying to find a word that's more descriptive of forward thinking, responsive to what people want. You know, if we go to Paris, let's say, uh, people would say Paris is a charming city. It's more than charming, perhaps it's harmonious. There are very strict rules about how tall a building can be, the materials that, that they have to be included in the building, that sort of thing, the uses even of the floors. Um, and it adds up to a sense of harmony uh, and sort of um, you feel comfortable there because you know... But they also have a lot of French people speaking French, which adds to the charm, right? <laughs> Whoa, but yeah, can, yeah, I, but yeah. can I counter this and just say, let's take another city if we're going to do that, Washington, D.C. Lots of harmony in terms of the public buildings, but the really interesting parts of Washington, D.C., as you and yep, I know, and are the neighborhoods that have sparked up and are completely idiosyncratic and not sort of charming, but really interesting. But, but you know, I guess the thing is that cities have their public areas and their, their sort of private areas. Mm -hmm. And when we think about Toronto, we don't think about the neighborhood that I live in or necessarily Cabbage Town, those kinds of places that I mentioned, mm. even though it's charming. We think about what's happening at King and Young. We, we think about what's happening on Blur Street. We think about, you know, where the, where the baseball stadium is. The, the, those parts of the city 
that belong to everybody, not necessarily just the people who own or who live in houses. Okay, there. follow up on that then. When you think about what's happening at Young and King or a Young and Egg or near the Sky Dome or what Rogers Center, whatever, when you think about that, what are you thinking about or referring to? You know, you just you just touched on one of the points I want to make, which is I believe that the city is under such um, uh, pop, uh, pressure to change. The pace of change is so fast that nobody, the, the, I should say not nobody, but we feel an increasing sense of alienation. We feel untethered. Uh, and when you just mentioned Sky Dome, names, the names of, of public buildings is another example of that. It started as Sky Dome, then it became something else, and now it's <laughs> Rogers Center. The O'Keefe Center became Hummingbird, and I don't even know what it is right now. <laughs> Everything is up for sale. Everything is up for grabs. You know, they're going to move Ontario Place now. They're yeah. going to, you know... Even the Leafs don't play in Maple Leaf Gardens anymore. Exactly. Or in a place listen, named Maple Leaf something. It's a supermarket. I know, we sound like You're a couple just, of fogies here. Just can, I, can I read this here? This is from a publication called Stories. Mm -hmm. S-T-O-R-E-Y. I write for it. Well, about to quote you. coincidence of coincidences, <laughs> I am about to quote from you. Oh, great. Here's a piece that Christopher really uh, recently wrote. And uh, Sheldon, if you would, bring this up and I'll read along for those listening on podcast. The speed of change has reached the point where whole blocks can become an empty wasteland, terra incognita overnight. The city feels like a money-making operation run at the whim of an industry drunk on profit. Aided and abetted by local planners in Queen's Park, everyday buildings as well as important cultural institutions and whole ecosystems are up for grabs. It leaves locals not just dazed and confused, but angry, untethered, and increasingly alienated. Except for the obvious landmarks, Union Station, City Hall, CN Tower, everything seems unnervingly temporary. Don't get too comfortable in your hood. Home or habits all could disappear at a moment's notice. Wow. He wrote that. He did. What do you think of that? Yeah, he's pretty damn eloquent. There's a reason he was a journalist for all those years. Well, again, you know, you're talking to two older white people who have lived here for a couple of decades. I moved around, but, you know, we need to talk to all sorts of other people mm -hmm. who come into the city. They may come in for an event, like they may go to see an event, a hockey game or a cultural event. They may go to the ballet and they're coming in from other parts. They may be visiting. Their experience of the city is quite different, I think, than people that are going to wring their hands and say, oh, it's just not the but way you know, it used to be. <laughs> just a sec, Chris. And I also think that we've got to be careful about I don't know if I agree with you about uh, that they don't come and look at certain parts of the city. I think there are lots of people that come to visit family, for instance, and they may be in Scarborough, or they may be in North York, and they may be in Weston, and they actually have landmarks there that are part of the fabric of that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And I, I do think the challenge we've got is we're accommodating tens of thousands of people coming in every year. And how are we going to accommodate growth? And as you said in the preamble, this, this the Ontario government has taken a position about trying to open up the mm -hmm. capacity to build more units, and so there's going to be neighborhood change. Mm -hmm. And the, the challenge I think we face at the, at the Canadian Urban Institute across the country is how do you balance input from local folks who actually have a vested interest in the quality of the built environment and the need of the future people that are coming? Does, does our fear of the kind of change that you referenced in that excerpt that I read lead to and result in more nimbyism in this city where nobody wants anything built in their backyard? Well, I think it certainly encourages that. It sets the stage for, you know, nimbyism that's worse than we ever had before. But, you know, I, I think that Mary makes some good points, but I would say to her that the fact that I'm old and white and male has relatively little to do with what I'm saying because I look at neighborhoods like Thorncliffe Park, mm -hmm. which are very immigrant-heavy um, uh, neighborhoods, um, the neighborhood around uh, the Ontario Science Center. Mm -hmm. And those people um, who are probably not born in Toronto or in Canada feel strong attachments to their neighborhoods mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they don't want the changes that are being foisted upon them either. And I think the thing is that, of course, we all expect change, and change can be good. I, I mean, I think change is absolutely desperately needed in a city like Toronto. But the, the type of, of change that we're experiencing here and the rate at which we are experiencing it makes people feel uncomfortable, and it makes them suspicious. Can I pick up on that with you, Mary? Because we're talking mostly about Toronto so far. Mm -hmm. But Ottawa's a big city, Mississauga's a big city, Hamilton's a big city, Brampton's a big city. Mm -hmm. Are the kinds of things we're discussing here 
the same issues in other big cities as well? You know, city. nobody wants change. It's an adage we can all just uh, drink coffee on and know is true. The question is, how do we actually encourage development to make some sense? I think that's part of what you're saying, Chris, is it's it happening is. so quickly. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a perception people have. We were talking about how grumpy people are at the moment. And uh, it's because so much is happening. The construction is happening. Oh, there's also this crane and that crane. And what about, you know, and we've got inflation, all these other pressures. I think the dilemma post-COVID is that more people are able to work from home. Mm -hmm. There's tons of people that still go into their offices or to their workplaces. And so we still need vibrant neighborhoods and we need vibrant places where you work. And the balancing of that is gonna be tricky. And I think one of the vacuums we sometimes have is we don't have sort of public leadership that's positive about how you cope. I was thinking in London when they went through four and a half or five years of their enormous transit investment mm -hmm. and it was awful mm -hmm. when that was going on. But now they have the Elizabeth line. But now line. they have something gorgeous. Yeah. So how do we continue to encourage people to think in the longer term? What I hear from Chris is that there's a level of distrust, right? The, they won't trust that eventually we'll get through it? Go ahead, Chris. You know what, I, if, if you look at development in Toronto and planning in Toronto, which is you know even more important than the architecture and everything else that we think of when we think of charm, mm. um, most of it's piecemeal. The, the city planning is one building at a time. Everything is planned and approved or not mm -hmm. in isolation of everything else. Mm -hmm. The one part of the city that has been done well, I would say, and which is uh, an example that we should all follow and which offers hope and optimism for the future of Toronto is the waterfront. Why? Because the wa because Waterfront Toronto started, you know, in 2020. Oh, no, 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 2000, sorry, 20, uh, 20 years ago. And they spent the first two or three years planning the whole waterfront from Scarborough over to Etobicoke. They divided it into a series of precincts. And the, the plan for each pre pre precinct was put out for an international competition. So we had the best planners in the world in Toronto working on the waterfront. Mm -hmm. Now, Doug Ford at the time was saying, it's a boondoggle, there's nothing going on down there, I haven't seen a thing in three years. No, because they had the whole thing planned out. And now, when the developers go down there, they know that on the site 35B, they have, uh, are entitled to build 35 uh, story building, and it must be made of sustainable material. That's why we have all those wood construction buildings down there it has to be uh, lead platinum blah 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 so the, 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 the conditions are set and it's planned as a community as a whole unit not just tink 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 like that having said that though there there uh, well you tell me I talk to people who say there's a sense around this town that everything's going up so much so fast all at once the cumulative impact of it mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. is to give one a sense that the place a little out of control right now. Mm -hmm. Do you not feel that? I, I mean, I do sense that people mm -hmm. like you are feeling that. There's a lot of sturm and drang about it. I think one of the challenges we've got, if you look towards the west side of the city and you say how all those condos suddenly seem to go up along the Gardner, mm -hmm. and you think, well, where was the public realm investment? Did we anchor those developments around shared services and shared amenities so people have a concern? Did we get the schools right? Did we get the parks right? So I think there's an anxiety that's contributed to there. I, I would say, Chris, that one of the dilemmas we have the waterfront's taken a long time, and people have been grouchy about how long it's taken, right? Yeah, and it's been it's worth 40 the years. Race. And it's been, been and the question is whether it's But if you look at, for instance, Region Park. 20 years. Because I'm talking about waterfront trauma. Can I just make one oh, other quick right. point? Mm -hmm. The other thing they did that was quite brilliant because it was a uh, sort of semi-industrial wasteland down there. I know because the Star Building was down there, right. so I when washed Street, it out of my used window. to tread those fields. Hmm. Yes, trip over those fields. But the first thing they built that people could see was Sugar Beach, right. Sherburn Common, places like that. So people could suddenly think, oh my God. In other words, public they focused investment. on the public realm mm -hmm. and people could suddenly think, you know what, I could live here. Mm -hmm. I can suddenly see this in a different way. It's not just a place I drive through on my way somewhere else. It's a place I would like to stay now. And the emphasis is completely the opposite of what we're doing. And when poor John Tory decided he was going to build Rail Deck Park, 21 acres in the heart of the city, and then it turned out, oh no, you can't do that. The condo de uh, developers are, have already mm -hmm. already own the land. But so. isn't that one of the challenges you've got? You've said the waterfront, it was kind of an open tabula rasa, you could kind of, and they're taking their time doing it. Regent Park's another, where they raised several mm -hmm. sites and then built something up. The dilemma that you're speaking about, Steve, that most Torontonians are dealing with, is that they're in a neighborhood that's already built up in some way. And so how do you increase the density? How do you take main streets, for instance, that have 
interesting retail, the ground floor, and have two or three stories above with interesting housing. Yeah, can we, we have some suggestions? Convert those? We have some suggestions have here, actually. Let's have a look. I want to talk about a part of this city, and again, for those living outside the city, we're going to go to the junction now. The junction's in the West End. And we're going to first show an art. It's a bunch of different pictures of different uh, stuff going up. Mm -hmm. This is a photo from Gerlach called Junction Point. It's a mid rise building, eight stories, 111 units, Dundas Street West. An auto body shop used to be on that site. So I guess we can infer from that that um, this is a better use for that site than simply an auto body shop because lots of people are going to live here. Still under construction. For those who can't uh, see because you're listening on podcast, this is a bit of a triangle shaped thing. It comes to a point. Okay, Christopher, start us off here. This is a, a you know, not just simply a, a rectangle or a box or, you know, dropped into a, a neighborhood somewhere. It's a bit interesting looking. Eh? It certainly is. So it's what do you think of it? I like it. I wrote about this building uh, when it was first mentioned. Um, it's, it's got a lot, there's a lot of drama in this building. At that point, you know, uh, you can't ignore that. It, it could be, it almost could be dangerous. It, it's so sharp. <laughs> there's another building like this down on Mill Street. But the thing, the interesting thing here, Steve, is also that it's a mid-rise building, eight stories. That's a really nice height. And there are all kinds of opportunities in neighborhoods and on main streets where buildings like this one, or at least this, this size, uh, could be built. and enhance the neighborhood. There's room for retail at, at the street level. There's um, room for people to, you know, like people like me who, who, who have a house, you know, with all these bedrooms that are empty. Uh, I mean, I haven't been to the third floor of my house in six months because <laughs> I have no need to go there. Mm. So wouldn't it be nice if I could live in the neighborhood? I could stay there and live in a place like, I mean, they're so useful. But, you know, developers don't like them because there's not as much money to be made. They're, you know, they're just as, just as difficult and just as awkward. They require just as much approval and red tape and so on. But there's much less payoff in the end. OK, let me show Mary the next picture here. This one, that one was Junction Point. This one is called Junction House. Mm -hmm. Same neighborhood, low rise, neon sign on the roof, mm -hmm. kind of cool. Uh, that's the, I guess, signaling the entry point to the neighborhood. You know, this is nine stories, uh, white and red brick. Is it bigger on the top than on the bottom? It kind of conveys that look mm -hmm. about it, that it's sort of, uh, it's not just a box. It's got some mm -hmm. context to it. I don't know. Mary, what do you think? Well, a couple of things. I mean, you know, talking about specific projects, and I don't know the specifics of either of these projects, but you can see that it's a bit brutal the way that you, that building is meeting the exi what the houses are next to it. That's a little unfortunate, but it could just be the photo. Here's, I think, one of the challenges that Chris is speaking to. When you see this mid-rise stuff go up, mm. it's often very formulaic and pretty dull uh, and it can look the same repeatedly it's as if there's this this and i and i am a little more sympathetic that i think what happens is the development community gets a pattern and a design that they know the city will approve and it's just easier to get it approved rather than that kind of initiative the first one you showed which was kind of interesting had some interesting architectural elements that's the first thing so i think variety is a really important thing okay. and i don't quite know how to get it okay sheldon put that pick back up again if you can for a second because the idea i appreciate that it's quite different from the houses next spot next right. door but the idea i think was to convey a kind of a gritty warehouse yeah yeah no no and thing. listen i don't want to be cr particularly critical of these individual projects but one of the just a sec chris one of the dilemmas we have here is we can't see the context and so chris mm -hmm. and i are arguing so much of it is about public realm around it one cautionary comment i have about these units and these developments and i don't know what the answer is but if you think about if there were prior to this if there'd been sort of typical main street retail on the main floor mm. and that gets knocked down and you intensify and add housing units you lose the housing units that were above the store that are generally affordable mm -hmm. and it's very difficult to put mom and pop independent retail into that kind of a development because of the, the, the cost of these things you tend to get chains okay so I think we've got to think really thoughtfully about new mechanisms that will encourage independent well, retail to locate here let me put that to Christopher there's a new thing in town well I don't know how new it is but facadism uh -huh. where you take you know uh, in, in a way the what they used to call the Air Canada Center now the Scotiabank Arena is facadism, right? Yep. You've got the old post office building at, yep. at street level, mm -hmm. and then up goes the big construction behind that. We've got one six blocks north of here on Montgomery Street, mm -hmm. where the old post mm -hmm. office is yep. the facade, and there's a big condo tower that's gone up behind that. It maintains the streetscape, the old streetscape, while at the same time building lots of big new stuff around it. What do you think? 
For the most part, it doesn't work. Um, but there are examples where it does. Air Canada Center is one of them, or it's not whatever it's called. Scotia Bank Arena. Scotia Bank no. Arena, yeah. uh, because uh, it's maintained at a scale that's big enough to still have the original impact. And there's mm -hmm. another stretch on the west side of Young, south of Wellington, the BCE place. Yes, it used to be called a whole row of 19th century retail uh, buildings. Um, nothing, nothing especially fancy about any. Them, but it works because it's a whole block. But too often, uh, it's just a question of some poor facade that's kind of been squeezed into the, like the Bay Adelaide Center. Mm -hmm. It's terrible. And you know, it's not fair, I don't think, to the new building, and it's not fair to the old building. They, mm. bo they both end up with the worst of, of, of both worlds, it seems to me. We got another example of something here. It's a fake facade. Sheldon, quit putting this up, pick seven. This is mm -hmm. kind of trying to create fake character with a newly built, old-looking facade at street level and then a sort of modern, gleaming condo going up on top of that. This is College Street, just east of Spadina, mm -hmm. downtown Toronto. Three stories of a facade meant to look old and the rest a new, new tower on top of that. Mary, what do you think? You know, these attempts at what we would call faux it's a faux Faux facade. is better than fake. Yeah, the same okay. idea, though. Yeah. I, you, know, I, I, if, you, know, you know the old adage, the greenest building is the one that's already built. Would you rather see an adaptive reuse of an existing structure and intensify around it? Yes. Um, I think these are a little... They, they, it's so hard to do this well, eh, Chris? It's a mess. Yeah. The building you showed is a mess. But look, think of King Street West uh, yeah. from, let's say, Spadina East um, to, what, University. Mm -hmm. A lot of those old um, warehouses, mm -hmm. uh, factories even, have been saved and they become office buildings, they become lofts, they become art galleries, they become restaurants. Okay, they are so flexible. Mm -hmm. And you know, I sometimes think that the best thing an architect could do is just to build flexible space. Mm -hmm. Because then it, it, it can adapt. It can adapt. be repurposed, absolutely. Exactly. E each generation, you know, want something different, the neighborhoods change. We don't have in industry happening anymore in, Tro in Toronto, but we can still use those buildings. There That's is... what's happening downtown. We're gonna have to see a repurposing of those, hmm. some of those commercials. Yeah. yeah. There is no bigger change happening in any neighborhood in this city than 50 meters outside the, the studio. Now. Exactly, mm -hmm. Young and Eglinton. One more picture here, Sheldon, picture number eight. Young and Eglinton, there are more cranes in the skies at Young and Eglinton than the entire city of Boston. So says Jennifer Keysmat. <laughs> Um, you know, when it's done, I mean, there are literally billions and billions of dollars worth of condo units going up at Young and Eglinton. There's a $12 billion LRT going east-west along Young and Eglinton. The subway is already there. They're redoing the subway platforms there. When it's done, if it's done, I mean, this should be pretty cool, don't you think, Mary, Absolutely. at some point? Absolutely, yeah. but boy, you have to be patient, don't you? You do. And yeah. we were talking, you know, about how people who are in this neighborhood and have been here for 20 years, their children have only known construction zones. So the level of patience that's required, what you just have to hope, fingers crossed, that, that the bets they made in terms of how they actually approve these various buildings, and if they've made sufficient investment in the public realm, that it will fit together. But that being said, <laughs> you know what? It'll open and it will feel not quite done and it'll feel too sterile. And then over time, time is the, is the friend of neighborhoods. Mm. Things. Time is the great healer it is the great of healer. neighborhoods. It will evolve. But you know what, Steve? The work will never stop. That's the thing. I mean, it was, I remember when the Minto buildings were built across the road from here. Yep. Huge outcry. And Mary's right. People got used to it and they did some nice things. They put that little uh, passageway in between yeah, the two buildings. Yeah, a little Yeah, and yeah. a new tr um, uh, traffic light so people could... You know could... what, Christopher? I remember David Crombie was a guest on this program just after those buildings were built, Mr. 40-foot bylaw, right? Mm -hmm. And I said, what do you think of those big skyscrapers they're putting up across the road? He says, I love them. In fact, I bought one. He moved yeah. into one. He yep. did. Uh, yes. He liked it. Put that pick up again if we can, Sheldon, number eight, because this is this is sort of a futuristic look at, at what Young and Egg could look like. Uh, Lifetime Developments, Toronto Realty Boutique got, dot com, if you want to go online and look at, at more of this kind of stuff. I remember, somewhere in the middle of all that used to be a three-story <laughs> brutalist, the best of East German architecture, <laughs> where you used to go get your OHIP card renewed. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know what that building was called? It was called Ontario Government Building. <laughs> Now, how's that for a fancy, creative, <laughs> dynamic title? But and you, now we've got the Minto Towers there, which are so much better. I, and that's a good thing. Yeah. And, and I'm not saying it isn't, but I think that what, what the point here is that 
what what dictates um, development and growth in Toronto too much to to do to too great an extent is the value of property mm. everything is reduced to its value as a piece of property and that's why the construction will never stop i don't remember exactly when the minto buildings went up but it was quite a while ago i would think 20 odd years not not quite that okay, long 15 yeah. to 20 okay yeah. and so that was one big huge project now they're going on at davisville all the way up when the subway's done the 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 plaza the, the, the whatever it is on the um, northwest corner will have to go. And I'm sure they're already well, thinking... We're here about, on the southwest I, corner and they got $2 billion worth of plans for this place. But, exactly. But, but this is not unique to Toronto. I no, mean, no, I, I'm I not, lived in New York for years and this is the same challenge. I'm not saying it there is. There was a concern about the real estate invest and the real estate community having too much say. Here's one of the things that we need to think about. Mm. How are we going to find ways to measure the cumulative impact mm. of this kind of intensification? And what are the kinds of things that we should be watching for? And similarly, what kinds of policy tools need to be put in place for the city to be able to exert some kind of measure of monitoring and control. And who's so going to be the new balance. mayor responsible for it yes, all? Yes, and, and, oh, yes, and but, what about leadership? <laughs> but I also think a large part about bureaucracies and systems and the, the civil service, you know. But don't you think that the other side of this coin is the fact that rents have gone through the roof in Toronto? Oh, sure. And there's a kind of insecurity, uh, anxiety, panic has. that people have. Mm -hmm. I hear it about it all the time. They don't know what, that they will be able to afford the rent next month. There are two rent strikes going on mm -hmm. in the city right now. Mm -hmm. That's the other side of this out of control development. And this, you know, real estate and, and housing um, are homes for people, it's, but it's been reduced to a commodity, like so many other things. Well, I suggest that we reconvene this group in 10 years and see how Young and Eglinton and some other parts of the city have gone yeah. in the intervening decade. Yeah. What do you think, Ian? If I'm still alive, I'm in. <laughs> From your lips to God's ears. <laughs> Christopher Hume, Mary Rowe, thanks so much for joining us here on Pleasure. TVO tonight. Pleasure. Thanks, Steve. That is the agenda for Thursday, June 8th, 2023. A note before we go, a few weeks ago, our Ontario hubs brought us the story of community efforts to keep the emergency room in Minden, Ontario open. That ER has now closed, and you can read columnist Matt Gurney's opinion piece on who's to blame for the snap closure at tbo.org slash Ontario hubs. Tomorrow, Canadian households are carrying more debt than those in any other G7 country. Nam Kiwanuka finds out why that's risky for everyone. I'm Jane Jaganathan. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org, and Nam, we'll see you tomorrow.